Today is the 26th day of March 2014, and I'm very, very pleased to have Manoj Das with us to share some of his experiences in the ashram. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you. How did you first come to hear about Sri Aurobindo? Well, uh, like any any student of India of post or pre-independence days, naturally I heard about Sri Aurobindo, the great revolutionary leader, but the first son of Mother India, who demanded unqualified freedom for the country. Nobody else had done that beforehand. So our teachers would have told us, some friends would have told us, but that is all that I heard about Sri Aurobindo. What year was that, sir? Uh, at that time I was a student, mm -hmm. a high school student. And so, but then later I knew that he was at Pondicherry. He was a yogi, Mahajogi and uh, he visualized the human destiny as something which is unfolding itself, which is very glorious and golden. But I forgot about it. If you want to know how I became finally attracted towards him, yes. I have to go back to my own personal mm -hmm. convictions, life. You see, I was born in a beautiful village in India, on the eastern coast of India. I am yet to see such a lovely place as was my birthplace. My house was the last house outside the village. In front of it there were green meadows, miles and miles of extended meadows containing two natural lakes, one teeming with white lotuses, one with red lotuses. <laughs> they never mixed. And palm trees then sand dunes, then the ocean. So it was a beautiful area indeed. People were so nice. But in 1942, there was a severe cyclone which destroyed the crop and a famine followed to cut the story short. Epidemics followed. Though I was born myself in an affluent house, feudal house, but I could see before my eyes my familiar faces disappearing, hundreds of them dying. In those days there was no electricity in villages, so after the sundown, the smoke emanating from the cremation of dead bodies along the sea coast that will fill the atmosphere in melancholy. My house was raided twice by bandits. But these are all long stories. I have a book published by Oxford University Press called Changing the Rainbow growing up in an Indian village huh. that describes all these things. Now, what happened was, I saw the human suffering in its very bare, naked condition. You see, I was studying in a village primary school, it's a remote village, there is no question of learning English or anything. I had to walk about one and a half miles, always my father used to provide me with a servant. And one day, I was going to the, there was a temporary relief kitchen, that is to say, the government had opened a kind of relief center where anyone who could reach the center could get a handful of rice and some pulse. And I have seen a couple, old, not old, they are famished couple, crawling to reach the relief center, but by the time I come back from the school, I have seen them dead midway and vultures and dogs are surrounding them. That was the condition. Impossible to imagine today what India was before in the early 40s of the last century, remote villages in particular. So the problem of human suffering practically disturbed me very much. And uh, I kept the town, small town, my hometown, Belasur, remote, uh, from the remote village I came to the town. That's a big <laughs> change for me. And I, I was very much always upset with this problem of human suffering which I had witnessed and I was trying to find out could there be any way of uh, elevating the human suffering coming out of that particular condition from which time to time humanity suffers. 
and I came in touch with a few Marxist friends, elderly people, but uh, chances brought us together mm -hmm. and they taught me the preliminary lessons of Marxism. At that age, I was uh, 13 or 14, I, at that age, I believed that this is the best panacea for human suffering. Huh. And uh, I was, I became a, in those days, there was only one Communist Party in India, CPI, Communist Party of India. There are no so many splinter <coughs> groups. It was a very disciplined party. At the earliest opportunity, I became a member of the party also. I have no quarrel with them even now. They're good friends of mine. I believe like any great political philosophy, Marxism also has a share of truth. There's a different matter. But my question was limited to human suffering. Mm -hmm. So I worked as a uh, Marxist as sincerely as I could, organizing student movements, trade union movements, peasants movements, participating, courting arrest and jail, and uh, all these things were happening when I was a student. Mm -hmm. But my fundamental quest still remained human suffering. What is the remedy for it? A time came by the time I was, um, I had just ceased to be a student. I had completed my LLB course after graduation, then MA course, and then I had come out of it and I was a lecturer in a college. At that time, a, while I was in jail before that, two years before that, I was in, pri in, in the prison house. There was ample time because before and I had no time to meditate. I had no time to be silent. I had no time to look into myself, to analyze my own knowledge. What have I got? Is it sufficient? Is it answer? I, have, I had no time at all. It was full of tumultuous moments in my life. But there I got some time and I reflected on the issue of human suffering. I, it dawned upon me that the cause of suffering is something deep-rooted it is not simply confined to the economic problems or political problems or legal constitutional problems. It is something much deeper. When I came out of jail, I was studying all kinds of religious books. Huh. And I had some professors who were very disturbed that uh, I'm still speaking of my student days, those who did not like me to be an atheist. So whenever a holy man comes to their house, they would invite me for lunch or dinner with him so that he could brainwash me. He could so, uh, I mean, yes. sow so some seed of light, but so, I used to poo-poo at them, I used to laugh at them, and... So you were a professed atheist at the time? I was, and I used people who had some sanskara, some religious taboos, mm. they used to be part others would send them to me for me to eradicate <laughs> <laughs> these things from their mind. <laughs> so I was, and then, as I was searching for my... Uh, answer to my question. Mm -hmm. It so happened that a friend of mine, he was also a communist once over a time, and he, had, he was a greater seeker than I am. And he uh, came of a princely family, and uh, I'm speaking of Vishwambar Babu. Mm -hmm. And then he, it was he who introduced me to the life divine. Oh. And uh, I, it so happened that, you know, sometimes events happen which assume suddenly a tremendous significance. I was, first I could not understand much, though beautiful prose, I was charmed by it, hypnotized by the prose, but still it was difficult for me to catch it. So I, I, I found one day an article written by a great Marxist leader of those days in a Bengali magazine, I could read Bengali, mm. Dorsan, the philosopher of Sri Aurobindo, a huge article of 40, 50 pages. Mm. I started reading it. It was more bewildering than the original Life Divine. But he was trying to criticize Sri Aurobindo. He was trying to find fault with Sri Aurobindo. But my, my feeling was that there is a mountain and a pig is going or a boar is going and trying to uproot the mountain. It bleeds, the mountain remains the same. So he was trying to contest a philosophy which was too great for him. So that was my first shock of realizing that Sri Aurobindo was too great somebody and whom mental and the intellectual approach could not tackle at all. And then I again tried to read Life Divine. Somehow this time it was becoming simpler for me. I remember one particular 
the moment uh, I was at my residence at Katak, clouds had gathered, a storm was approaching, and my servant had sucked all the windows, glass panes windows. Outside the windows there was, there was a small rose garden. Mm. A tiny bird had been imprisoned in my cabin, in my room. And it was again and again trying to go out of the room and into the freedom of the rose garden and the infinity. But it was dashing against the invisible glass, coming back. I was reading Life Divine, something at that moment that between the realities, man's, man's goal of God, light, freedom, bliss and immortality, between these goals and the present condition of human being, there is an invisible barrier, something like this, not from Life Divine, but it, the meaning was like that, which we do not know, and that is unless we cross that, we cannot realize those ultimate, all these, those pristine goals of mankind, which uh, are pursuing men from the dawn of awareness, consciousness of man. And uh, so I thought, I am like the bird, who is trying to find something, but the invisible barrier is stopping me from going there. Then I started seriously reading Sri Aurobindo. One day my friend asked me, how do you find Sri Aurobindo? Then at that time, I told him, I remember the answer, he is the most intelligent man in the world. That far I went, no further. Most intelligent man in the world because nobody else has thought man to be an evolving being. That man himself could evolve. We have taken for granted that evolution has come to a bankruptcy with the evolution of man. That beyond it something could be there. None had thought about it, but here is a person who has unfolded a certain new possibility before us. So he's the most intelligent man in the world. <laughs> that's, that's all I could say. But I was curious about what was he doing in Sri Aurobindo Ashram. By that time he was no longer there. He was mm -hmm. 57 when he passed away. I'm speaking of early 60s. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in 63 February, you know before 63 mother had stopped giving darshan for. Yes. I read about mother a little bit about from regarding, from the literature regarding Sri Aurobindo, I read about her. But to be very, very frank and to be precise in my expression, I never believed that a human life, body, human frame could contain something which we call divine, my concept of divine. I never thought it, I never believed in it. Mother must be a great person, that's all. In uh, Mother Dasam was stopped for one and a half year almost. And I remember there was a man from Orissa, one of the earliest residents here, Ramakrishna Das. We called him Babaji Maharas, very fondly. <coughs> a traditional sadhu. He was a traditional sadhu at Ozodhya, living at Ozodhya. One day suddenly happened to read in a Hindi newspaper, which came as a wrapper for some commodity which had come to him, about Mother and Shiva Bindu. Such was the enlightenment of this man, imagine, he could at once feel that that is the goal of his life. Traditional sadhu, a yogi who had disciples among them, a man is just a judge of the high court, a raja of Ambawa. But suddenly, without informing anybody, he broke away from the traditional life, came to ashram, and he was, his work here was cleaning the dishes in the dining room. And so he was the man who had, was in contact with me, mm. and he wrote to me that there is a possibility of mother giving darshan on 21st of February, 1963. Amonos Babu, you please try to come. But I didn't take it very seriously. And I was a lecturer at that time in the college. I was one day, I remember the coincidence, I was coming from the college. And uh, I just thought to reply to Babaji Ram Krishna Das that I won't be able to come this time because I'm too busy with many works. I was editing a magazine which was the most powerful and popular magazine, literary magazine in my mother tongue, apart from being a lecturer at the college. So I won't be able to come. Suddenly something told me, if today I go home and see any letter from Pondicherry, I will come. And there are four letters on my table. First was was Prabhupada Ram Krishna Das. The first sentence in Oriya, the translation of which will be, Manoj Babu, Mother's Darshan is certain, you must come. I decided I'll come. I came, 
we reached here on uh, 19th of February or 20th of February, I have forgotten now. 20th of February, myself, my wife and uh, my brother-in-law, the mm -hmm. man who initiated me to, this boy about whom I spoke, who gave me life divine, he happened to be my wife's elder brother mm -hmm. and uh, highly intellectual chap and uh, uh, physical, but anyway, so he was with us also and uh, my mother oh. and all we came and my Pratigya, my wife's mother and father also. In Power Guest House we stayed, but at, at that time there were no such sophisticated mm -hmm. rooms, there were all dormitories and we, had, we were, we were uh, allotted one full dormitory. And 21st February morning, I was suddenly I saw that I have got a great curiosity developing in me. Mother will say, what kind of person will we see? But I was blank, nothing revealed. And when the mother appeared on the balcony, first thing that impressed me was a few thousand people were standing in front of the dispensary under the terrace. There wasn't a whisper. Silence. Silence in such crowds was a new experience for me. I was also looking at the terrace, expecting her to appear any moment. But my mind had stayed or I was thinking something. Suddenly I woke up to the fact there is a kind of spectacle before me. I remembered, oh, this is mother. But I tell you sincerely, I had never imagined that so much beauty could be contained by a human frame. She appeared to me like the beauty of the horizon where the sun is setting, like all the hues of rainbow, all the goddesses pictures of whom our Indian painters had painted some total of all their beauty, everything and then still something more. It was inexplicable and I couldn't believe my eyes. First I thought, am I under some kind of a spell? And then no, it was physical, it was real. Mother went day and I remained in a condition of days for some time. And I remember one of my professors who was earlier used to be worried that I am an atheist, he saw me in a part guest house and said, Manoj, she was very uh, cautious that I may be critical, I may say something which, is, which will be offensive to him. She asked, Manoj, what was your experience of the mother? I said, sir, there was a time, I understand, when she appeared every day in the morning, the balcony. How did people go back after having known that tomorrow again, along with sunrise, she should also appear on the balcony? How could people go back? And uh, he couldn't believe what he heard. <laughs> he was so, I mean, overwhelmed with himself with a kind of emotion. But then, uh, next day, my wife and I were there, nobody else was there. I'm speaking, bringing out very personal, intimate things, which generally I should not. And I was very proudly telling my wife that, well, this is something wonderful. This place is wonderful. I feel some kind of atmosphere which is nowhere else I have felt. Not that I had seen the whole world, <laughs> even a big part of the world, but still, whatever I had seen of any Indian sacred place or holy place, but this was something unique. And I told her that I think, I believe, one day I would like to stay on here. And she quietly said, if one day, why not today? That's all. Both of us wrote to the mother separately. Ah. We didn't want to club ourselves. Hmm. And, well, mother accepted. Straight away she gave me work, class, and center of education. But she didn't give any work to her for the time being. Just allotted us a beautiful building, a double-storied house, all for, for both of us. And we had never written together. But she said, let them stay there. It was a Karno house. It was a Darbhanga Maharaja had remodeled it. And beautifully he had redone it. The whole double street house mother gave us. And after seven or eight months, a small children's home was created. And my wife was in charge of it. And then we shifted to a bigger building. Gurisa government built a house for children, Hobo Progress. And we were there, but subsequently her classes, she psychology classes became more and my classes also became too many. So we left the 
uh, responsible of the hostel, the children's home. Mm -hmm. But uh, 51 years have passed now. <laughs> we have been here with Mother's grace. We enjoy. I think I have not spoken more than what you needed to know. <laughs> well, we want to know about your birthdays and going so. to see Mother on your birthday. Yes, yes. Please tell us. Yes. Well, my first experience about birthday was this. 63, my birthday is February 27th. So by that time, it is a coincidence that the day Mother, we did not know, I did not know that my birthday was 27th February because in, in my home state we celebrate birthday on the, according to Indian calendar, not English calendar. So, it so happened the day mother accepted me. It was 27th of February. Oh. I found out afterwards it was her birthday. But that first day, of course, I did not go to the mother. Next, 64, I went. If I can summarize my experience, it was like this. As I entered her room, I was in a condition which I cannot exactly translate into words, but subsequently, when I came out, I felt that time past, time present, and time future all stopped outside her room. The moment you entered her room, it was a different dimension of time, where there was nothing like anxiety, nothing like tension, nothing like disturbance, nothing like uh, clumsy thoughts. It was a different dimension of time into which you walked simply. Well, that was one of the several experiences have taken place. This was the my first experience of going to my on my birth to the, to the mother, her pronoun. And when she gave you your birthday card? Yes. It she was would a, greet you with yes, yes, one yes, fact? Right. So, yes. Several times that has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Tell me about your uh, teaching in the school. What courses do you teach? Well, uh, to begin with, I think oh, my students are only, you are my student also. <laughs> so, uh, so to begin with, I was teaching only English literature. Mm -hmm. And whether I was a good teacher or a bad teacher, my student should be able to say. Future <laughs> poetry. <laughs> I was teaching poetry, future poetry. But subsequently, more and more of my students wanted to study Sri Aurobindo's works with me in the higher course, ah. and um, uh, so apart from English literature, and my favorite subject is Shakespeare, of course, but apart from English mm. literature, I, uh, I was, I mean, learning with them while discussing works like Esajanda Gita, Sintesya Vijogo, Life Divine. Uh, I'm especially works. interested in future poetry. Uh, no, that was my interest, no doubt, but uh, I was specially interested in the life divine. I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. The first book I began with the reading of Sri Aurobindo, and it remains till today always an adventure. Whenever I open life divine, the adventure, the spiritual adventure repeats itself, and nothing is there. Of course, Savitri is there, but Savitri I never took classes, students ah. even if no. Because I did not think that Savitri can ever be explained mentally and it should not be explained also. So I and mother also was not in favor of anybody explaining Savitri. So once in a while I was obliged to guide a student with allusions. For example, there are references, there are phrases, proverbs. Say, Sri Aurobindo refers to Sphinx, riddle of Sphinx. So unless the student is told about the yes. meaning of these things, that's, that's all that I was doing, but never trying to explain mm -hmm. the great lines in Savitri because I believe that they should only be read and absorbed. They would unfold their meaning themselves. But life divine, of course, I used to be very fond of. Now, from those early days, mm -hmm. what changes do you see today? Yes, changes are natural. Changes have been there. Um, early days, there was greater austerity in the ashram, in the atmosphere, in our lifestyle. And, uh, and for everything, any doubt, any problem, dilemma, 
there is the mother. We refer to the mother, yes, yes. write to the mother. She would give the solution. And we are fond of writing to her on many occasions. In the home of progress, that uh, big children's home, three student building, which was built by mm -hmm. my government of my home state, Odisha. And we had no fans. So somebody gave one fan, ceiling fan. I wrote to the mother. <laughs> so today I feel what an absurd thing to write about. I wrote to the mother, mother, this and such and such man has given it a uh, ceiling fan. Should I fix in one of the rooms? Mother's answer, but what about the other rooms? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> I could have to be of me, it was to ask her, because really there, all the students are there, it's our rooms, right? But once I have brought to her notice, the next six months, five or six months, all rooms are filled with fans. It, it was, I have brought to her knowledge, that's all. I didn't fix it, it, it remained, but <coughs> fans came. Others donated immediately. No special effort was made. These are all, ex you, can, you can interpret them as experiences also. Yes. It is not very simple things, small things. So, um, well, uh, that was that. So, now things have changed. Now these challenges, but the changes are meant for challenge. They have to be taken as challenge. Mother is physically not there. But I can never for a moment believe that mother is not there. She is very much there. And so it is a, her physical absence is a challenge, an invitation, and also an extension of help to be more and more inward, to have a relationship, to develop a relationship with her inwardly. So that I believe externally ashram has, uh, it has not remained as austere as it was. Mm. But internally, I believe, with my very small capacity to concentrate or to lead an inner life, there are many people that must be leading more profound in our life. But the moment I try to understand, I see that the great force of the mother, the love of the mother, I think, are active in the atmosphere. And uh, from that point of view, there is no change. So far, the lady, the inner life is concerned. There is no change. I always feel that Pondicherry town has changed. When I came 51 years ago, there was no beautiful promenade like this. It was a dusty road leading yeah. to Park guest house. Yeah. Very few individuals in the evenings. There wasn't a single auto rickshaw. Mm -hmm. Taxis were out of the question. Rickshaws, hmm? uh, humanly manipulated rickshaws, Handful rickshaws, cycle rickshaws, they were the vehicles. Now it is like any other South Indian town, equally polluted, crowded, yeah. and uh, noisy. But there is an inner Pondicherry. The moment you are in Rapu with that inner Pondicherry, you are in a different world. It is still there. <laughs> I remember one small incident uh, years ago. I, my first, one of my first, should I go on? Please, please. One of yes, my first uh, astounding experiences was, right in 1963, it is a hot summer noon. And uh, I'm coming out of the ashram, I saw an old man with a young man, as a support, I believe, standing in front of the ashram gate. And he just smilingly looked at me. In those days, hardly any visitors inside the ashram. It was never crowded. The ashram campus was never crowded. And so as he smiled at me, I just smiled at him. And then suddenly he asked, do you live here? I said, yes, I have just begun to live here. Suddenly he said, how lucky you are. I said, why do you say that? He is a Muslim, I remember. He said that I was a Muslim by birth, but I am absolutely free in my perception of things. I am not, I don't have any taboos. I was a professor of mathematics in a Madras college. He said, I have, from my childhood I was interested in mysticism. Mm. And I thought, once I retire, I will tour the places of India, and wherever I find a spiritual presence, I will reside there. And he retired some 25 years ago. At that time, Sri was there. And he said that first, I was in Madras, Chennai. So I think Pondicherry is a holy place. Let me begin with Pondicherry. He said that I came here and I had once a glimpse of the mother. 
not Sri Aurobindo, but I could profoundly, I was, I could see a profound presence here. I could feel a profound presence here. I thought this is the beginning, and vast Indian subcontinent has many other holy places to move about. So I went from here, and for 30 years I have been moving, moving, moving about. And today I came here. I said, my God, this is the place where I should have stayed. This was the place I should have settled down. Now it is too old, I am too old, it's too late, I can't live without any support and I cannot ask the ashram to accept me. This is a useless thing. He said to this and quietly he passed. I mean, he went away. No, another thing, what I remember about the inner Pondicherry, soon after that, I think it was a foggy morning, not soon after, interstellar guest house had just been met a few years ago, two, three years later then. And one, Early morning, it is a foggy morning again. I am just coming towards the ashram. I saw four or five gentlemen, all white kurtas and uh, pajamas. They are in an agitated way, they are, they are talking something am among themselves and returning, I mean, uh, turning away from the ashram gate towards the canal they are passing. It is none of my business to become curious about anybody. I don't know what pulled me. Hmm. I felt uneasy. I went closer by and I heard them talking like this. One is saying, well, I think we'll go back. Uh, we cancel our program. We go back to Madras and catch the flight to Bombay. And then I know that they're irritated. I said suddenly, excuse me, I am interrupting your talks. What is the problem? Problem? Last night we raced here. I, from airport we came and straight and checked in witness the guest house. We do not know about card and all that thing. Midnight we came. In the morning we thought we will begin our day in the ashram, doing Pranamartya Samadhi. We came and we were turned away from the ashram gate. They said, where is your card? I said, Are you, we are, I found them. They are NRIs as we call, Gujarati NRIs. Very fine gentlemen they are all. And uh, we came and then, but this is the, this is the beginning. We have been so ill received i better we go back i said pardon me i want to just put a question to you why did you come to pandisiri samadhi is there mother is there i said did the behavior of the gatekeeper nullify all these realities that the samadhi is there and the mother is there and uh, they didn't say anything i said look here the poor fellow he is an employed uh, he is a person who is a retired something, police constable, or army man, somebody, I don't know who he is or he is a regular person, but he is governed by a mechanical rule. Whomsoever comes early morning, before 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, whatever it is, he must have the card, otherwise people who are meditating inside the ashram, arranging flowers in the ashram, they may feel disturbed. So, uh, but that is not the reason for your going back from missing the very reason for which you had come all the way. You come with me, please. And I took them inside and they get what didn't say anything naturally. And I said, how many days will you stay? I will stay two days. On the fifth day I saw them. I said, what happened? You have to go to... No, no, we feel something so good. We have prolonged our stay here. <laughs> they are an ally. They are from Britain. Britain, that Britain they came from UK. And uh, so this is that inner Pondicherry is still there, you yes. see, which is beneath the crowd and beneath the lavalu of the external uh, uh, hard realities. There is that inner Pondicherry. Do you meet people from <clears throat> different faiths who okay. come here? Yes, 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 so many. Who have some experience somehow of Sri Aurobindo or Mother or their force? Yes. There are, there have been. I have uh, several visitors, practically from my own discipline, there's writing, writers, <coughs> some journalists and writers. There, uh, there have been among them Christians, mm. among which other faith I can't remember now, but there have been Christians, of course, not one, but several. Those who have come here to Pondicherry stayed here, and they have return as devotees also and return is uh, and they are still in touch with the ashram so many of not one at least i can easily recollect seven or eight names but there may be more even yeah. <laughs> um, 
and the young people today. Can oh, you yeah. say something about them? Uh, or to them? You mean young people of? Who uh, are seeking, who are in school here, the children, the, uh, the young people of the world. Mother said after four, five, six, seven, mm -hmm. there would be special souls taking birth. I believe so. I believe so because one thing I have seen for a person of my age or earlier times, if one turned to mysticism, it could take him any number of decades, 10 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, to realize something, to come something to depend upon, mm. to cling to. But today I see instantly it happens. It happens in many cases, almost overnight. An atheist comes, a man, I mean there are of course many people who claim to be atheists, are not really atheists. One young man came and very confidently told me, I have something very to confess before you. I said, what? I don't believe in God. I said, never mind, God won't mind it. And immediately said, you won't mind, no? <laughs> <laughs> so many people are under delusions that they are atheists, but they are not atheists really. And so, now, but even those who are genuinely atheists, genuinely pragmatists, rationalists, uh, a professor of mine, he was a great rationalist, not atheist. Years before I came to the Asum, he was given a book by the mother when he went to for pranam, the mother, that book. And for years together, nothing had happened to him. Suddenly one day he opened the book and he was in tears. He was crying and crying and crying. That means the book was working within him. Deep inside him, the words were working. One day suddenly it comes to the surface. Yeah. But it took him some 30 years or 25 years. With modern students I have seen, they are so clear, my own students, they are so clear about their vision of the future, their a problem, the problem, the questions they bring to me from Life Divine in mm -hmm. I can't imagine that a traditional seeker could have asked such <coughs> questions even after a study of his, in his own discipline for 10 or 12 years or 20 years. So I believe what Mother said that there are very open souls and they are of course shouted by many kind of uh, temporary transient temptations and our uh, the, the dharma of the time, you can say, mm. with so many of diversions and everything. Yes, yes. But I have seen also it doesn't take him, take them long to recognize the reality at the core of everything. So I believe that a new generation is coming, though disguised and still camouflaged and as if they are not open. But it is brewing within, blooming within. It must be the case with the whole youth of the world. Wonderful. Questions? So, can you speak something about the new race that is coming? The Superman race? Oh so no. The present no. contest of the world. So, uh, what are the things happening? <laughs> Any changes coming or you have to wait? All, to that, all that has been said in the Savitri. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, yes. I cannot have a prophetic language for it. I cannot see it. I can feel that a new age is bound to come. Man was not an accident. It is not for nothing that the whole panorama has been created with all these beautiful harmonious flowers. What is that consciousness working beneath in the sunlight, in the earth, in the air? Each flower is unique. Who had planned all these things? And that mighty visionary could not leave man a half-made creature as we are today. Something is about to come out and something has to happen. This same harmony who is in which that power has succeeded in nature will also be implanted or also will be translated into the conscious human life and future men will grow out of it. That is all my faith is. I cannot give any details about it because I am so ignorant. Thank you. But do you think that work is 
happening, that transformation? I believe so. That is my feeling. Yes, 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 certainly. Best experience of my life, meeting the mother. <laughs> there is no other experience. The first thing, you see, the mother has four aspects. <clears throat> Mahalakshmi, Mahajuno, Mahakali, Mahasaraswati, Mahaswari. Now, that experience never repeated. That is the touch, I mean, of the Mahalakshmi aspect, the tremendous mm. beauty. It touched me. I know other people who have been touched by other aspects of the mother. So, each time I went to the mother, I had an experience. But uh, they together constitute my finest moments in life. Bunch of fi finest and sweetest and most, uh, uh, what should I say, elevating moments in my life. Did you write to mother often? Yes, not often. Not often. No, no, no. I spared her that <laughs> <laughs> trouble of reading yes. through my letters, but often did I write. Yes. Sometimes when I have doubt, for example, in 1971, mm. there is another episode, and I was writing a series of articles in the Illustrious Weekly of India, the, the then most popular, powerful magazine. You remember Illustrious Weekly of India? And the series was called the Saga of Baghazatin. He was a great freedom fighter, martyr, who directly fought with the British Army and let down his life. It was in my hometown, near my hometown. Oh. So his son was here, elder son. And uh, some documents were with him, but, uh, but So he gave me the documents and I wrote a series of three articles. One day I received a letter from G.D. Birla, the Doyen of Indian Industries. <coughs> You know, Birla, Birla's. Birla, yes. Those are only two houses, Tata's and Birla's. Today there are many billionaires. But in those days, these two houses were there. J.D. Birla was the, I mean, the grand man of the Birla setup. And uh, the letter has been, she has written a letter to the editor of Illustrious Weekly of India. The Birla, she has read the articles of Manoj Das with interest, but he would like to make one correction. Charles Tegat was not the police commissioner who fought with. Bhagajatin, it was another name. He gives Charles Tegat who came after, the, after that. You can bring this to the author's notice or a reader's notice without bringing in Mr. Birla's name. His secretary is written to editor of Illustrious Weekly of India, who was another very famous man, Khuswan Singh, who died only a few days ago at, at the age of 99. He was a veteran journalist. And so Khuswan Singh, <laughs> he has scribbled to his secretary on that letter. Send this letter to Manoj Das and ask him to reply to Birla. So I didn't reply to Birla. I wrote to his secretary, who has written the letter, original letter, that I am so happy that Birla has read my articles, but I am absolutely sure about my facts. And I wrote, why I was sure? Pat came reply from Birla himself. You are right. See the humility of that great man. You are right. I was temporarily confused, etc., etc. And then he recounted his childhood association with the revolutionaries. And it, till then there are three revolutionaries, Andaman Itan, Sudhir Sarkar, and others were there. I asked them, they said, yes, of course he was with us in his young days. Later Gandhi claimed him, <laughs> and he became a great Gandhi favorite, Gandhi's patron, uh, financial patron, you can say. Birla House is where Gandhi died. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he was also there. Anyway, so, uh, then correspondence followed. In mm -hmm. one of his letters he wrote to me, you are a very good writer. I want to be of some assistance to you. Tell me what I can do. 72 birth sentence of Sri Aurobindo is coming. So I wrote to him, I have read in newspapers that the second bag containing the correspondence between Morley and Minto, Minto was the Governor General of India, Morley was the Secretary of State for India, in charge of Indian Affairs Minister. Yeah. I had a hunch that the second set of letters must contain some reference to Sri Aurobindo. So I wrote to him, you must be having a London office. In those days, Xerox system has not come, photostat copies. I said, can you make some photostat copies of some documents which I need from more to correspondence? They have been transferred now to India office library in London. I'll be grateful. He wrote to me. 
these things cannot be done by my office. You proceed to London. I will bear all your expenses. Mm. In those days, getting a passport, foreign exchange was very difficult, 71. It was not like today. <laughs> Any moment you can go, not like today at all. I sent his letter to the mother. I wrote to the mother, this has happened. Mother said, yes, you can accept the offer. Then I got passport, everything ready. Suddenly it came to my mind. This is all a hidden secret ambition to go abroad, to go to London, because we are all born in under British rule. So to go to Bilat, as we all to go, to go to England, it was a great dream in those days. So it must be that suppressed dream coming, finding a British now. I am not a historian. I do not know if there is anything under parliamentary correspondence about Sri Aurobindo. I wrote to mother. Mother, I don't feel like going. I, I do not know if there is anything at all. And I'm betting in the bush. And uh, it is just an ambition of my childhood to go to England. That is what has surfaced. But I wrote on the letter, go, go with my blessings. I went, I hit a jackpot. No Indian historian had told us that there was a complete debate in the House of Commons on Sri Aurobindo, spread over three sessions. And no other person than Ramsey MacDonald, the future Prime Minister, taking up the cause of Sri Aurobindo. When Sri Aurobindo has left Calcutta, come to Pondicherry, then Ramsey MacDonald says, I read in a paper, newspaper Times today, mm -hmm. that there was a fresh warrant against the Aurobindo Ghosh, but it could not be served. What for was the warrant? We want to know. Then the Assistant Secretary of State for India, that is the Deputy Minister for State of India, Montagu, he says that it is for an article, seditious article, written in Karmazugin, a magazine which Mr. Aurobindo Ghosh edited. Who are that article? Ramsey MacDonald asked. We have not yet got it. Government of India has not yet sent us. Two days later, Ramsey MacDonald asks again, where is that article? It has not yet come. Third time he asks, where is the article? It has not yet come. He passes a copy of Karma Zogin from his own court and says, here is the, in normal post I have got it, and here is the article. I am reading the article. Tell me where citizen is. The whole article he read in House of Commons, only one person murmured, Honorable Member Ramsey MacDonald, Mr. Ghosh is a Bengali. His article must have been written in Bengali. This is your English. Ramsey MacDonald quietly says, Mr. Ghosh's knowledge of Bengali is as good as my knowledge of Bengali. He is practically an Englishman. And this brilliant English, he uses that word, this brilliant English is his. Then he again goes on reading. All these things, Indian historians, I don't know why they never told us. So I got these records. Parliamentary correspondence, of course, I got. And there is a book of mine called Sri Aurobindo in the first decade of the century. But it was 20th century. Now it is second edition is called Sri Aurobindo in the first decade of the 20th century. With all these records are there. But now I'm writing a bigger biography of Sri Aurobindo. In Mother India, it is being serialized. Two and a half years, I have written already 30, 30 or 32 chapters. Mm. And uh, many new documents I have got. What was your experience in England? I mean, that time. Yes, uh, when you went. I was absorbed in India Office Library with finding all these books. Mm -hmm. I, from, I was taking Indian YMCA. From the Indian YMCA, I would straight come to the mm -hmm. <laughs> old India Office Library, <laughs> the archives, work and go back three months. Before, before I went uh, to England, I went to the mother for pranam. And mother asked me, you are going to London? I said, yes, mother. For how long? I said, mother, maybe six months. Six months? Immediately, I said, mother, I will come back as soon as your work is over. <laughs> I came in three months' time. So, uh, two and a half months I spent there. I was there a couple of days in Scotland because mm. uh, Morley or Minto, one of them belonged to Scotland. So, his private papers were there in Scottish archives. I consulted them. Then, through a few cities, I came back. So, my experience was <laughs> nothing, actually. <laughs> Nothing, nothing really, really I can remember. Subsequently, I have been several times. Ah. But uh, wherever I go, I stay with my friends. I, those who are Sri Aurobindo, people belonging to the 
eriyaps you are with so arabs you are with so at home i feel what book are you writing now well or more than one you see i have a creative writer i i my works are all fiction novels short stories etc etc i am not a historian at the moment i am writing sure of in this life and of course i write for several newspapers magazines please tell you are a wonderful story writer pardon wonderful story writer you have edited uh, yes. chandra mabha and many other magazines so tell us something about your books that you have written oh <laughs> you are perfect <laughs> <laughs> yes we will have another session for that for you exclusively we will do that in another yes. session yes yes so i believe I any questions no all right thank you thank you sir okay <laughs> wonderful